Okay, I think we're going right there. Uh, I think we're on. Everybody say hi, Amber. Hi, I don't know if she heard that or not, but anyway. Okay, so here we go. You guys have these, right? Okay, if you take a look at the scope of what we're doing here today, everybody, it's not that long of a section, is it? It's five slides. And it's just broken up into two parts. The first one right here, everybody, is dealing with a concept called circular cross sections. I don't even want to talk that much right now about what that means. I think we're going to dive into a problem and you guys are going to understand by the end of the day today the two different types of 6.3 problems. So the title of the section, everybody, is important. Solids of Revolution. What was the first kind of volume problem we did last week? First thing in 6.2. We called it solids. Not all at once now. There we go, Ashley. Thank you. On an axis right there. So you started at an origin and your thing kind of grew out of it. That worked uh, specifically for what two shapes, everybody? No. Pyramids and cones. There you go. The second one we did, the second half of 6.2, we called solids on a plane or on a base right there where we talked about pouring a concrete foundation and then building something up in the z direction out of that i actually feel guys that what we're about to talk about right now with 63 is easier than what ooh, i think it's harder than the first type we did but i think it's easier than the second so we'll call this the the happy medium right there okay so solids of revolution um you guys ever taken a quarter and spun it on your desk or a table okay what does it look like it kind of looks like a sphere, which is a how many dimensional object? Three dimensional object, but of course a quarter is, it's more or less flat. It does have some thickness to it, you're right. But for the most part, you can take something two dimensional and spin it in such a way that it looks like it occupies three dimensional space. In a way, that's what's gonna happen here. We're gonna be starting off with flat two dimensional objects and we're gonna be revolving them in such a way so that they do form a three dimensional object that we're gonna be making or finding the volume of. So like I said, I don't think we need to spend, this is a nice section in that we don't have to write down any real definitions. We don't have like theorems or formulas or anything there to work on, okay? We just need to dive in and start looking at what these problems look like. Do you guys remember a week or so ago when I told you that every volume problem was going to use the exact same formula? Guess what? This one does. What's the hard part been in every one of these problems, guys? Coming up with the A of X formula right here, or A of Y, or A of Z. And once again, that's going to be the somewhat tricky part today, but it's not going to be all that bad. So let's take a look at what's going on. So within the, the, the topic of circular cross-sections, which we'll explain later, are flush against your axis of revolution, let's look at this. So the region in the XY plane, everybody, what is the XY plane? That's the plane you've spent 99.9% .9 of your time in in math over the last five years. It's made up of the x-axis and the, with no mention at all, of the z-axis. So we're starting flat is what that means. The region in the xy plane between y is equal to 2 plus x cosine of x. That is not a function I'm expecting you guys to be familiar with, so don't panic about that. So between that curve and the x-axis on an interval from negative 2 to 2 is revolved around the x-axis. Okay, So we've got something flat. We're going to spin it around the x-axis and it's going to create a three-dimensional solid that we're now going to try to measure the volume of. So let's get drawing. The good news is this is easier to draw than what we were doing in the, in the second part of 6.2. So we're going to draw everybody just a regular simple xy plane, nothing real fancy, and this graph doesn't need to be huge either guys. All right, and we're going to draw this curve from negative 2 to positive 2. Now, I am not, okay, I am not real interested, everybody, in getting this graph super accurate, okay? It really doesn't have to be. We just want to get some kind of picture of what's going on right here. So you'll notice I'm just drawing a 2 by 2 grid right here. I might need to go a little bit bigger than this, but not much. As I said, everybody, this is not a function. I need you guys to be super familiar with. So I'm going to just open up a whole new document on my calculator right here. And no, I don't want to save those changes. All right, gotcha. And I tell you what, everybody, we're going to put a calculator page in there, but we're also going to put a graph page in there. 
and let's get working on this. So the function we're dealing with is going to be 2 plus x cosine x. Do you guys remember the problem you can get into right here? What just happened? Yeah, it's italicized, which means the calculator is trying to figure out what XCOS means and it doesn't know. So we need to put a multiplication symbol right there and then everything stands up straight and I think we're good. So 2 plus X times the cosine of X. And when we graph that, everybody, we get this. Is it what you expected? Yeah, you probably didn't think real hard about it. It does some crazy stuff, and we don't need to be too worried about it. Unfortunately, that F1 of X label right there is right kind of in my way, so I'm going to move that up. Okay, so it's looking something like this. And we are only interested here, guys, in what happens in between X values of negative 2, which is right about there, and... Two. So I don't know, this thing kind of goes down and up as it crosses the y-axis, up and then back down a little bit. So like I said, this doesn't need to be a perfect graph, everybody, but I'm thinking it's going to look something like, let's see, it started high, it came down, it looked like it came back up. Ooh, I don't like how I drew that. Hang on a second. I uh, did something like this and this and then something like that. That is not a perfect drawing of what that curve looks like, but Good enough for right now for what we need. So there's our region. Of course, there's more. It's got a domain of all real numbers, but we're only really interested in what happens here, guys, between negative 2 and positive 2. Now, right now, this looks an awful lot like a problem from early in Chapter 5. What does it look like we're about to be asked to find? The area of that region right there. Now, we're not but it's a start, okay? So that particular region right there, and I usually like to shade this in, guys, like we've been doing. What color crayon do you want to go with today? Pink, huh? Okay, we'll do pink. All right, no, I was pretty adamant about that. Now you can't see the pink at all, though. That looks terrible. Orange. Go barbs. All right, we'll go with that orange. That's a little bit more visible right there. Okay, so what we have here, everybody, is a flat two-dimensional object right here. And we're now going to take this flat region and do what with it? Okay, well, drop makes it sound like it's like that. Okay, but it's being revolved around this thing. And either way you want to go with it, forwards or backwards, whatever, this, this thing is now spinning, everybody. And it's going around the x-axis to create a three-dimensional object. Now, as far as drawing this goes, here's what I'd recommend. The first and easiest thing you ought to draw is what it looks like 180 degrees apart away from where it is right now. So let's just draw this thing drop straight down, okay? And again, everybody, this doesn't have to be perfect, but I'm going to kind of copy these red segments here, like, ooh, sure, something like that, and then maybe something like this. Okay, and trying to mimic that blue curve, everybody, it might look maybe something like that. How'd I do? That's not bad. Seems a little bottom heavy to me, but okay. Now, right now, is this thing a three-dimensional object? Not really. It's still really just a two-dimensional object. So we've got to do just a little artistic trick, everybody, to make this thing look 3D. Do you guys want to view this thing from the left or from the right? From the right. Okay, so if we were standing over here looking this way, what shape would we see, everybody, as we look at this figure? If you were standing right over here, okay, looking over here from right to left, and this thing was formed by going like this, by revolving it around the x-axis, we would see a, you'd see a circle. And it would be solid, too. There'd be no hole in it. What you would see right here, everybody, is something that looks like this. Okay? Now I think we're starting to see it. And again, if we're looking from that side on this end, oh boy, we would see something that looks like that, but we wouldn't be able to see this edge right here. That would be hidden inside. And now all of a sudden, we kind of maybe, if you squint a little bit, start to see how this thing looks like a three-dimensional object. Now, I heard a couple funny things right there. It looks like, kind of looks like a fish. I agree, this looks like the tail fin right here and that kind of thing. Will you? Looks like a vase. 
I think a lot, right? We've got a vase at home that looks almost exactly like that, where that would be the bottom, and then here you go. The big difference would be a vase is not very effective, everybody, in its main purpose, unless it is hollow. So you can put stuff in, right? This is actually a solid figure, guys. It, it, it's filled inside, so that's the big difference. I don't know why. Anybody ever seen like a, like a, like a drawing or something from like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea of what a really old scuba diving like, like setup would look like? That always reminds me of the helmet right there. Oh, oh okay, there you go. All right, so this is what we have, everybody, and that's as much time as we're going to spend. But I got a question for you, and this isn't really up for debate. What we want to do right here, guys, we said the hard part was to come up with an A of X formula. And the only way these volume problems work is if all of your cross sections are what to one another? Close. Now, those of you saying proportional, you're on the right track. The word from geometry is similar. Okay? And similar means same shape, but different sizes. Now, if we want all of our cross-sectional slices to be the same shape, everybody, which way are we going to cut this thing? Perpendicular to the y-axis or perpendicular to the x-axis? If I cut this thing this way, I'm just going to get some kind of weird shape. But if I cut everything this way, I'm always going to see what shape when we open this thing up you're always going to be circle, uh, see circles right there. So that already tells us something important, guys. Is this a dx or a dy problem? We're cutting perpendicular to the x-axis, everybody. So yeah, this is going to be a dx problem. So basically, guys, when they tell you that something is revolved around the x-axis, that's going to be a dead giveaway there, everybody, that this is going to be a dx problem and not a dy. Inversely, everybody, if we were revolving around the y-axis, that would be dy. So quick little things to look for here, guys, as you're going through it. Okay, so this is going to be a dx problem, meaning we're slicing this thing vertically. And so what I always like to draw here is just one of the slices. Pretend this is a big loaf of bread, and we're going to cut this thing right down the middle and take out one of those slices. So when we do that, you guys see these little circles we made on the end? The exact same thing is going to happen right here. One of those slices is going to, actually, I like to make two slices right next to each other to think about a loaf, a slice of bread here coming out of that loaf. And there's the back end of one slice, and there's the back end of the other slice. And it looks something like that. How thick is that slice, everybody? Infinitesimal. How thick is it, everybody? The piece of bread. It's really, really thin. In fact, its width is approaching Zero. That goes along with the dx comment up there. All right? So what I want you guys to realize now, that's just one slice of bread. But every one we take, they're all going to be the same shape, everybody. And what shape is that? Circles. So now let's go back. Now that starts to explain this comment right here, guys. The problems we're doing right now are circular cross sections. You spin this thing, you cut it, and every time you open it up, you see what shape? a circle. So the hard part of these problems is coming up with your cross-sectional area formula. So let's start with something really basic, everybody. Our cross-sections are what shape? Circles. And what's the formula for area of a circle? Pi times your radius squared. All we need to do now is represent R, look right above it, in terms of, in terms of x. Now how do we do that? Well, let's go back to the diagram and let's draw one of those radii. Let's take a look at the little circular slice of bread that we just cut right here. And the radius would go from the center of that circle straight up. And that would be little r right there. Is r going to be constant or variable in this problem, everybody? It's not always going to be the same. It's going to vary. How do we measure? Well, we've done this a lot lately. How do we measure the height of a vertical line segment? Top minus bottom, very good. So here we go, everybody. If we want to measure R, and let me do this right down here, what stops R on the top? 
the function of 2 plus x cosine of x. Uh, now, technically, minus what stops r on the bottom? The x-axis, which is 0. So if it makes you feel better to put the minus 0 there, go right ahead. But in this case, you could get away with forgetting it or, or ignoring it, OK? So that's what r is. Technically, this is r of r of x. That is a of r. We need to compose those two to make a of to make a of x. So that's what we're going to do right now, guys. a of x, then, is going to equal pi times, what is our radius? 2 plus x cosine of x. And don't forget what, which is really easy to lose track of right now. OK, this is area of a circle, guys. It's got to be pi times radius, and it always needs to be squared right there. OK? Now, guys, that binomial for a of x isn't going to get a whole lot better than that. That's pretty much what it is, OK? Yeah, this is a good spot to be, though. We've been saying for a week and a half now, maybe two, the hard part is always coming up with a of x. And now that we've got it, the rest of this is going to be no more difficult than what we've been doing in the past. So here we go, everybody. Volume. Nah, that should be blue. Volume, here we go, is equal to a definite integral. We said taken with respect to? With respect to x. Two things we need to think about, and then we're done. Integrand. Now, I'm going to be the first one to tell you guys that if it were me, and I were you guys taking this test on Tuesday of next week, I would probably save time and just write what on my paper? A of x. And as long as you have clearly labeled right here, guys, what a of x is equal to, that's perfectly fine. And that's a habit you guys should probably get into. I will look for it, and your AP graders will look for it. Will, it only works if you labeled things clearly. But if you did, it'll be there, and we can find it. Now, that said, we're not really pressed for time right now. So I'm going to go back and do this one the right way. I'm going to write that integrand up there right down here. Where am I going to put the pi? Out in front, just a good habit to get into with constants. And then the variable expression is 2 plus x cosine of x quantity squared. Every time we do this, guys, our cross sections are going to be what shapes? Circles. What's the formula for area of a circle? Do you guys see it? There's pi. And here is your radius squared. Now hear me out. It's really easy to forget one of or both of two things right there. What are they? It's really easy to forget the pi. And it's really easy to forget the square. So if you guys can just remember in your head, it's a circle, so it's pi r squared. Make sure you see the pi and the radius and the square. What's the only thing we're missing? Limits of integration. Lowest and highest values of? x. So let's look at it, guys. This thing begins at x equals negative 2, ends at x equals positive 2. Do we have any symmetry here? Not horizontally, the way we're looking right there. So let's not get fancy. We're just going to go from a negative 2 to a positive 2. And that should do it. Does that look like one I'm going to make you guys do by hand? No. The x cosine of x is a killer right there. That derivative would require the product rule, which means anti-differentiating it would require something skunky. So with most of these problems, you guys, we're going to go right to the calculator and let it do the grunt work for us. Again, you just need to make sure you're doing this correctly in your calculator. So let me go back to my calculator page. Don't forget to start with what? Your pi, right? So here we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop. That was weird. Oh, yeah, now it's fine. OK, so pi multiplied by menu 43. Definite integral starting at negative 2. Ooh, that was weird. Uh, negative 2, sorry. And ending at positive 2. And the integrand, everybody, in parentheses, 2 plus x times the cosine of x. Close the angle, close the binomial, and don't forget to square that whole thing. And we're integrating with respect to? With respect to x. That pretty much ought to do it, everybody. Survey says. <laughs> 
I was working with my seventh grader last night on Pythagorean theorem. He was using one of the multi-view calculators. So when he would go to put in like, hey, what's the square root of 40? It was telling him two root 10. He didn't really like that. So we had to talk about how to round it. How do we get a rounded answer here, guys, which is what they always want on these problems? Yeah, control, enter, everything else is the same. 52 point... 429, everybody. So volume is 52.429. And absent anything else, we should put what at the end here, guys? Cubic units, right. 52.429 cubic units. And that is what we got. Couple of questions. How bad was that? Tolerable? That's what I was going for right now. Second question, maybe the more important one, is the answer right? We have no clue. Do we have any way of figuring it out? <laughs> wow, you have a lot of faith in me, Ab. Oh, that's tough. All right, I guess my question was going to be this, two parts. Number one, is that a, a figure that we have a geometric formula for? Oh, God, no. Then my next question was going to be, that thing most closely mimics what geometric solid that we do have a formula for? Yeah, I think a cylinder. Now, it's not exactly a cylinder because uh, anybody have a cylindrical vase at home? Yeah, we have one. It's kind of boring. You just, you know, I mean, that's it, right? That's really easy because in a cylinder, guys, all of your cross sections would be exactly the same size. They, oh, what's the geometric word? They would all be congruent as opposed to these ones, which are all similar. So I guess what I want to think about is this. If I wanted to get a cylindrical vase with the exact same volume as this normal looking vase right over here, how wide, everybody, would that vase have to be? I'm kind of asking you about really what's the average height of this function? Now, I don't want to be here all day, all right? But I was pretty sure if I looked at the graph right, this thing crossed the y-axis at 2, am I right? So what would you guys think? And I wouldn't do this in your notes if I were you, because this really messes things up. But what if I just said, huh, what if we did this, and then down here to negative 2, and we made a really boring cylindrical vase that looked like this? Do you guys buy that the volume of that green cylinder would be roughly the same as what we just figured right there, or at least somewhat close. Okay, let's run with that. I'm going to erase everything I'm doing right here, so don't worry. But the volume of a cylinder, anybody remember the formula for that? It's area of the base times the height. Yeah, that's true for every prism and every cylinder, area of the base times the height. So for your base, everybody, it's a circle. What's its radius? 2. So pi times 2 squared is 4 pi. Okay. What's the height of this cylinder? And remember, height is being measured horizontally here, distance between the bases. Yeah, from negative 2 to positive 2, your height is 4, and that's going to get us 16 pi. Pi is roughly 3. 16 times 3 is 48. So I would say this is going to be a little bit bigger than 48. I'm thinking maybe something like 50. And the answer we came up with was 52.429. Do they match perfectly? No. Should they? Probably not. Are they close enough to satisfy you guys to say, you know what? Yeah, I think that answer is probably pretty accurate. Me too. Okay, so let me get rid of all of that junk. I don't want that messing up our beautiful work right here, but uh, yeah. I think we got it. Makes total sense, right? Mm, nah. Okay. Hey, you remember that program I've been trying to get installed all week? I think I, fi I, think I finally got it. All right. Um, I actually was calling them for a license right there, and then, uh, yeah, they uh, didn't have it. So um, I kind of messed with this a little bit. I don't know if this is going to save or not, but isn't that the function we were just talking about? And if you guys can tell, I kind of put A, the left. Oh, that's weird. Do you guys see that? Oh, that's strange. 
Oh, now it's all moving. All right, anyway, so A is about at negative 2 and B is about at positive 2. Oh, but now I lost everything that we needed. So this is basically the same thing that we did, but I thought this might be a little bit easier to, to illustrate and see what's going on here, guys. So what if I moved, oh, that's not what I wanted. Uh, what if I did this? I think I got to move everything together here. Oh no, this will do pretty much what I wanted. All right, so if we were to revolve this thing, here's your flat object now, guys, which is going to spin around the x-axis. Kind of looking, there's a way to zoom in on this and I can't figure it out. So there's that. Here's one of your circular cross sections, guys, kind of going between there. This is sometimes in various books called the method of disks. Okay, because we're basically making a bunch of circular pieces of bread that kind of looks each one like a disc right there. And uh, yeah, so that's basically just kind of an illustration of what's going on. I think there's a way somewhere to figure out what that volume is, but I don't quite know and where it went. And oh, now that moved on me. That's really bad. Okay, so let's pretend that didn't happen. But anyway, yeah, so uh, okay, stop. Okay, there, we'll just do that. All right. So that was kind of amusing. All right, all right. So that's one. Okay. Questions, or uh, we kind of get it well enough to move on? I'll go with that. Okay. Let's go to number two. Stop me if you got something, guys. All right, what's going on right here? Okay, region now. And actually, this is probably easier to sketch than the last one because the function we're dealing with is just a parabola. Opening what direction, everybody? Yeah, a downward opening parabola. Then we have x equals negative 4, which is what kind of line? And don't say straight. That one's vertical. And then we've got y equals 9, which is a horizontal line. There we go. And everything is being revolved not around an axis. Actually, that's misleading. Isn't it being revolved about an axis? Yeah, every line is an axis, just not the x-axis or the y-axis, okay? And we're supposed to find the volume of the solid. Anybody think they have an idea what this thing looks like? Yeah, I wouldn't either. So guess what we need to do? We need to sketch this thing out, everybody. So let's get rolling. Now, knowing what I know, kids, uh, you might want to uh, kind of mimic my graph here just a little bit. We really only need the second and the third quad. Nope, I lied. No, that's right. The second and the third quadrants, we don't need much in either the first or the fourth. So we've got the parabola y equals 9 minus x squared. So I'm just going to jump up, start this thing at 9 right here, everybody. And we know that it's a downward opening parabola that looks something like that. And of course, it does the same thing on the other side, although that's not going to matter too much. So there's our parabola. We've got the vertical line x equals negative 4. Now, the placement of this vertical line is important, everybody. Where does this parabola parabola across the x-axis? What value of x would make y equal 0? Yeah, negative 3 would work. And then, of course, where's the other one, guys? Yeah, over here at positive 3. Okay, so x equals negative 4 is to the left of that intercept right there. Now, I'm going to make it pretty darn close, everybody, for a reason you'll see in just a minute. So I'm going to put a negative 4 right there. And I'm going to draw the one and only vertical line that passes through there. And I always draw this badly. But isn't my parabola eventually going to cross that vertical line? Yeah. Boy, that looks like crap. But anyway, good enough. All right, so they're going to cross. And I'm pretty sure they're going to cross down in which quadrant, everybody? Third. Down in the third. We'll figure that out later. You think it's going to be important to know where they cross? Mm, probably. All right, and the other thing we need to draw is the horizontal line y equals 9, which significantly does what? Lily? Goes through the vertex of the parabola, right? So that's kind of important right there, and there's the line y equals 9. First off, does everybody see the two dimensional region now that's bounded by those three equations with a finite area? Okay, that's going to be this mess right over here, guys. So, yeah, yeah, give me that. So we're looking at this region right over here in the second quadrant and also creeping just a little bit down there into the fourth, excuse me, the third. So there, everybody, is our flat region, and now it's time to spin this thing around or they also use that word about for your different preposition right there. We're spinning this thing around or about what line? Which was the vertical line that we drew. So this thing starts here and is actually going 
this way. So this one is spinning a different direction from the last one, which was high and then went down low, didn't it? That one spun around a horizontal axis. This one is spinning around a, around a vertical axis. It's going this way. So let's do this, and I think I did the same stupid thing I did this morning here. Probably didn't give myself enough room to do this right. But let's try to draw everybody the 180 degree reflection of what this region is going to look like. So I'm basically going to go to this point over here. By the way, anybody know what this ordered pair is? I think it's negative eight, nine. Guys, what's the distance from here to here? Yeah, that's that four to the left, so another four to the left. And now basically, everybody, I'm gonna draw kind of the right half of another parabola that should cross at that same point of intersection down there on the bottom. And uh, if you want, not a bad idea, let's go ahead and shade that in too. So here's your 180 degree reflection, but right now it's still flat. How do I make it look like it has some depth to it? You draw that little oval that's meant to look like a circle up on the top, everybody. So up above, we're going to see something that looks like this and something that looks like this. And I would draw that on the bottom too, except the bottom comes to a point. What are we looking at here? Yeah, I kind of got to disagree with you ever so slightly. Why is this not a cone per se? It's got some curvature to it. Something you might have seen that does look like that with the curvature. Spinning top. A megaphone thingy. Will? Uh, nails are... Have you ever used a nail, Will? I, the, they're straight, okay? It's called the shank of a nail, and then they're just flat on the top. No, they're not really curved. Some of them are. Some of them are kind of wedged like that. Uh, actually, I thought you were going to tell me something different. A golf tee. Now, the difference would be this would be a terrible golf tee. What's the purpose of a golf tee? No, that's fine. But to hold a golf ball on top, this thing is perfectly flat on top, everybody. So if you wanted to take the time to balance your golf ball directly on a dimple on the bottom, it could work. But uh, that should kind of be hollowed out. Uh, music people. Does that strike anybody as any kind of brass instrument, which almost all come to that shape right there? Whether we're talking a trumpet, a trombone, a clarinet. Uh, you guys know this ain't my bag. Uh, sax, yeah, sure, so it gets a little bigger there. All right, so that's what's going on. Hey, everybody, which way are we slicing this thing? Vertically like the last one or horizontally now? Okay, we spun this thing around a vertical line, everybody, and the slices always go perpendicular to the axis of revolution. So is this a DX or a DY problem, everybody? Yeah, okay, we're revolving around a vertical line, so this is gonna be a DY problem right there, okay? And our slices are gonna look something like this, everybody. There's one cut, here's another one right underneath it. There's the back side of the top and the back side of the bottom. So once again, our slices, guys, our pieces of bread are all gonna be what shape? They're all going to be circles. So once again, starting with something simple, guys, we know that our cross sections are all circles, and the formula for their area is still going to be pi r squared. But we now need to figure out what r is in terms of what variable? In terms of y. Why is it y and not x this time? Because it's a dy problem because it's revolved around a vertical line. So let's do it, guys. Let's draw in one radius, like, oh, I don't know, maybe this one right over here. And let's try to figure out how long r is. Now, are we all agreed r is not a fixed distance here? No, it varies depending on your y value right there. So how do we measure the length of a horizontal line segment? Right minus left. But to do that, everything's got to be solved for x in terms of y. Now, give me a word here, guys. What stops r on the right? The parabola. The problem is, right now, the parabola is solved for y. We need it solved for 
x. So let's see what that would look like, guys. I'm going to switch the x squared and the y, and we'd get x squared is equal to minus y. And now what? Square root of both sides. And we get x equals, well, OK, the square root of 9 minus y, but that's only half the story. There really should be a plus or minus. But you guys are old enough now to start thinking about what that plus and minus means. The plus and minus indicate either the top and bottom half, for example, of a sideways parabola, or in this case, the left and the right half. Now let me ask you a better question, OK? What stops are on the right? You guys said parabola, but which side of the parabola, the left or the right? The left, so which square root of 9 minus y do we want? We want the negative. If we forgot to put that there, you guys, we'd be measuring r from here all the way to the right side of that parabola. And that is much, much more than we're looking to bite off right here, OK? So no, 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 no. We don't want that. That's why we need x to be the opposite of the square root of 9 minus y. OK, so let's keep going with that, guys. Now that we know this, that's what stops r on the right. So let me bring this guy down here. So r is equal to the right minus the left, the opposite of the square root of 9 minus y minus, let's look back up now, what stops r on the left? x equals negative 4. Yeah, that's right. So minus negative 4. Everything is solved for x. All right, so let's see if we can't clean that up. And boy, there's really not much, everybody. But r, I guess, could be written as 4 minus the square root of 9 minus y. I think that's as much as we can do with r. I think that's as good as it's going to get. So we now have r expressed as a function of of y. Let's take this back over here, guys, now that we know all of that. And let's bring it here. So area as a function of y, then, is going to be pi times your radius, which is 4 minus the square root of 9 minus y squared. Pi times radius squared. Can that be cleaned up at all? I don't really think so. So that took some work. It's still kind of ugly, but we do finally have a formula for area expressed in terms of y. So once we've got that cross-sectional area formula right there, guys, the rest of this should be pretty easy. Now it's volume time. So I'm going to go all the way back down to the bottom, and here we go. Volume is going to be a definite integral taken with respect to with respect to y. Our cross-sectional area formula is what we just wrote down in green. Where am I putting the pi? out in front, OK? And the radius here was going to be 4 minus the square root of 9 minus y squared. So don't forget the pi. Don't forget to square your radius. Two easy mistakes to make. And all we're missing are limits of integration. Lowest and highest values of y. Let's do the easy one first. What's the highest value of y here? That's going to be 9. Did we ever figure out the lowest value? Oh, so that's one more thing we got to do. So right, we need this point of intersection right over here, guys. That's the intersection of which two equations? x equals negative 4 and, and the parabola. So what do you want to do, Lilia? That was the better idea that somebody in first hour came up with after I did it a dumber and harder way. So we're going to do that. So Lilia's suggestion was, hey, this is a point right here, guys, that's on the original parabola. And we know that its x-coordinate is negative 4. So why don't we just plug negative 4 right up here? Let's see if that makes sense. Negative 4 squared and 9 minus 16 negative 7. Does that sound right to you guys? Anybody know the dumber thing that I did? Uh, which ones, though, Abby? You're right. Yeah, I took this right here, OK? Yeah. And I set that equal to what x value? 
negative 4, and I squared both sides. And it worked, but yeah, Lilia, good thinking. That was a much better idea. So what is the lowest value of y where this solid exists? Negative 7, so we'll put that one down here on the bottom. And once we've got all that, guys, it should be lickety-split, kind of, to go to the calculator and figure all that out. So let's do it, everybody. Uh, once more, everybody, we are starting with a pi, so let's do that. Whoop, 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 sorry. So pi multiplied by menu 43. Integral starting at negative 7, ending at 9. And our radius here, everybody, was going to be 4 minus? Yeah, the square root of 9 minus y. Get out of the radical. There you go. And don't forget to square that whole thing. And we're integrating with respect to y. Does that look good to you guys? Okay, that's where we're at. Hitting enter actually isn't that bad of a result right there, 128 pi over 3. But again, on most of these problems, because so much of the world is still using a TI-84 that won't, or a regular Inspire, they usually want this as a decimal, everybody, 134.041. So let's write that down, 134.041 cubic units. Okay, giddy up. That was a question. Aiden. Uh, I didn't notice that. Let me see here. Uh, I don't know. Uh, result obtained using approximate arithmetic. So it's telling us that it kind of uh, was full of crap there and BS'd a little bit. I'm not quite sure why that is, but don't worry, that's the same answer we got this morning. So I think we're in pretty good shape. I would love to try to verify that. We're short on time and I want to at least start the next part right there. So I'm going to ask you guys to trust me on that one. We all good? All right. So again, how are we feeling? So-so? Okay. The second part builds on a lot of those same ideas, everybody, but it uses a fundamentally different concept. This is called the washer method. Now, who here has done any work at all with anything related to nuts and bolts and tools and wrenches and sockets and things of that nature? Do we know what a washer is? It's an almost flat piece of metal, right? It's, it's round with a hole cut in the middle. And what goes through the middle? A bolt right there. There you go. And it's just a way of spreading out the force over a little wider area right there. It's got a lot of uses to it. Now, the washer, you guys don't need to worry too much about that. The washer itself is just the piece of metal that's in between the two circles, and there's nothing in the middle there. It's empty. A lot of people want to call this a what? A donut, but I don't like it because a donut has depth to it. A donut is three-dimensional. A washer is more or less two-dimensional. It obviously has some thickness. Guys, I don't think this is going to tax your brain too much. How are we going to find the area of that washer? Both circles and subtract. Let me just introduce you to a quick little bit of notation. The smaller circle, everybody, we call its radius little r. And the major circle, the larger one, we call its radius capital R. Okay? So, what can we play around with right here? The area of the big circle, everybody, is going to be pi times big R squared. Whereas the area of the small circle is going to be pi times little r squared. So if we wanted the area of the washer everybody. It's big circle area minus little circle area. So that's going to be pi times big R squared minus pi times little r squared. And that's really it. There's one tiny little thing we could do to simplify that. I don't even know about simplifying, maybe just rewriting. Factor out the pi. Pi times big R squared minus little r squared. So that's the formula we're going to be using right here, guys, for area of a washer. You need to know its major radius, its minor radius, and then see what you can figure out from there. Now listen, we're not going to get very far here, but let's see if we can at least set this up. I'm going to go fast here, okay? We've got a region between cosine and sine just in the first quadrant, okay? So let's try to sketch this out real quick, everybody. So here you go. There 
and here, all right? And a sine curve is going to look something like this and do that, and there you go. And a cosine curve is going to look something like this and that, and there you go. But I'm really only interested in what happens right here, guys, in the first quadrant uh, before those two cross once. So I'm looking at that particular region right here. And the weird part is that we're now going to take this region, everybody, and revolve it around what? The x-axis. It's going to go top down. So let's do the same thing I've been telling you to do. Let's try our best, everybody, to draw the 180 degree reflection of what this thing looks like. And it's probably going to look something like this and something like this. So here's the bottom half of it. And now when I try to draw those circles to make this thing look like a three-dimensional object, What's weird here that we didn't have to deal with before? There's a hole in the middle of this thing, okay? So when I try to connect this, guys, I'm going to see this and this on the top, and on the bottom I can probably see this edge, but that one's probably going to be hidden. DX or a DY problem? Meaning the slices go vertically. Gah! Does everybody see where the washers are going to come into play here, guys? When you cut this thing this way, yes, you see a circle, but with what in the middle? With a hole in the middle. So our cross-sectional area formula is going to change ever so slightly. Hey, we'll pick it up there manana. Probably should only take us about 15 minutes maybe to get through the rest of this, and then we'll take questions the rest of the day tomorrow, all day on Monday, and we're still looking at that test on Tuesday. Sound good? All right, go Bears. This